If y'all wouldn't mind um, just introducing yourself, my question to you is, who are you, <laughs> what do you do, and why? My name is Marin Gela. Um, I first identify, my, identify myself um, as a Filipina American before anything else. Um, so proud Filipina, born in the Philippines, moved with my family when I was a toddler to the Bronx, New York. Um, and my foray into political work is uh, through my job at the New American Leaders Project. Um, I am the program associate there, and there I support our national pipeline of immigrant candidates and public leaders who uh, want to shape the face of American democracy so that it can be a little bit, a little less pale, stale, and male, and <laughs> more reflective of the people that they represent. Um, so that is my nine to five. Um, we have four states in Arizona, in California, in Michigan, and we do have trainings here in New York City. Really excited to announce that we um, are hosting a training exclusively for women of color who want to ramp up their civic leadership next week called our Ready to Rise training, and we have about 140 women of color pledged to attend. Um, so that is my nine to five. Um, in my five to nine, um, I <laughs> help lead the Filipino American Democratic Club of New York, where we uh, organize the Filipino American electorate. Um, so that is me. Uh, my last week at the New American Leaders Project is next week. Um, and but it's really great because um, sadly Margaret Chin could not be here, but I will be joining her team as her comms director uh, starting June 12th. So really, really uh, paying attention to that pipeline and um, living up to our values. Thanks, Mary. Hi. I've never seen so many Asian faces together um, in a room that has politics behind us. I really feel like we're all here for a K-pop star to come out and get a show. But that, that, we'll get into that later. I'm Janie, I come from far away New Jersey. I think some of you may know that it's not that far away. <laughs> um, I live in a small town called Closter. It's uh, not too far from Fort Lee, Bergen County. It's a population size of 9,000. Um, in 2015, I ran for council without any previous um, political experience. The town has a population of about 25% Asian Americans, yet there was nobody representing them, uh, not only just as the governing body, but um, in Borough Hall, police, emergency services, you name it. And so I had lived in the town for 30 years, and I thought it was time for somebody to represent the minorities who were always knocking on my door asking for help. Uh, I graduated from law school so that suddenly elevated me to be all-knowing in town. <laughs> so maybe some of you have experienced this, but the older generations who get you know, tons of mail that they couldn't understand or translate would suddenly appear on my doorstep. Um, and so I, there was definitely a big gap that needed to be bridged. So I started asking around you know, different Korean Americans in town if anybody was willing or able to run for council, and then somehow I got stuck with the job. Um, in 2015, we had a very low voter turnout year. It was 18% in New Jersey, which was very, very dismal. Uh, I was told that after I had agreed to run, by the way. <laughs> I was running in a town as a Democrat when there had been no Democrats elected in over 10 years. Um, I was the first Asian American elected in Closter. So it was an uphill battle, but we won. We won by um, less than 30 votes, actually. It tells you how important each vote is. So that's what I'm doing. Um, this year, I've come out as a candidate for assembly in my district. In New Jersey, there are zero Asian American state legislators. So I'm trying to bridge a gap on a different level this year. So that's me. Thank you. <laughs> Before I introduce myself, I wanted to actually recognize one of my colleagues, Katie Rosick. So Katie actually um, helped a lot of the young women who start out in the assembly uh, by helping us acclimate and helping us kind of get involved in a lot of different ways because she's kind of paved the way for a lot of us. So thanks, Kaylee. Um, I also wanted to say how amazing it is that Nalpa threw this event. Um, 
I'm actually really proud of Knockoff because my mentor it was one of the founders of Knockoff National, Sharon Tomiko Santos, and so she was one of the first Asian American women ever elected on the state level, and so I was very, very proud to uh, be a part of this. Um, so my name is Yuleen. I actually represent Lower Manhattan. I am an assemblywoman here in New York, and I am the only Asian American woman um, in the state assembly here. Unfortunately, uh, there are only two of us. So this uh, last election, we literally doubled the amount of Asian Americans. <laughs> <laughs> the only um, Asian American at the uh, time was Assemblymember Ron Kim, who I worked for. I was his chief of staff for the last four years, and he was the first Korean American ever elected on to anything in the entire state. <laughs> I guess you could say we're a little underrepresented here in New York, and um, you know it's better than zero. Uh, but we have two. And although we are 10% of the state's population, uh, the Asian American population only has less than 1% of the representation here in our New York State legislature. So um, I'm very, very proud to represent my district, which encompasses the financial district. Uh, which you know everybody knows is Wall Street, and we also have uh, Battery Park City, Chinatown, and the Lower East Side. So that's my district, and I'm very very proud of this. So thank you very much for having me today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how you identify, and specifically, how does your Asian American identity relate to your identity as a feminist? Just to be real with y'all, I didn't grow up in a traditionally political household. I share this a lot with everybody, and I, I notice that I share this a, a lot in, um, in particularly political spaces. As like a disclaimer, hey, I did not grow up political. Um, this is all very new to me. Um, I think a lot of people can attest to that, being from the API diaspora. Um, so my parents didn't really instill with me this idea of you know going out to the rally, go protest, uh, uh, be vocal, be provocative. Um, I was really taught to you know, keep my head down, not make waves. Um, and so it really is the Asian American feminist predecessors before me. Um, found them through Tumblr, learned about their stories in Tumblr, part of the Tumblr book generation. Um, it's really those folks who catalyze the formation of my personal civic identity. Um, particularly, you know, one professor that I had in, in university, uh, Liz Uyang, who still does community work here in, in this district. Um, these are the folks who are unapologetically progressive, right, and unapologetically emotional about how they lead their resistances. And um, that sort of created a shift in me to start being involved in my own community. Um, but like. Knowing that I have been a late bloomer in this sort of political arena, I became a little bit resentful towards my mom. Um, but what I'm really thankful for about the Asian American feminist circles of, and you know, thought circles today um, is that we really emphasize the idea of empathy and the idea um, of racial solidarity at all costs um, so that I can check myself and my own privileges, so that I can better you know, understand the sort of social, political, and cultural factors that led to my mother making the sort of grooming decisions that she made as an immigrant woman who wanted to assimilate to a new country. Um, so it constantly checks my privilege and it helps me understand my relative privilege in certain spaces as an Asian, as an American, um, as somebody who uh, graduated with a bachelor's degree, um, and my you know, relative lack of representation and oppression in other spaces so that I can be a better, more effective activist. Um, so I use this lens throughout my work at the New American Leaders Project. We train immigrants to run for office of all genders. But what I'm really curious about um, are the specific and unique barriers that women of color face when they decide to run for office. It's really it's the lack of financial and political capital. It's the fact that they have a lot of other things to do, and they have their own sort of advocacy work that they're leading without even having an elected official title. And mitigating those gaps um, so that they can be more poised and positioned to lead their communities in elected office. Uh, so this was Asian American feminism is a term I did not entertain until two days ago when I was asked to sit on this panel. <laughs> I'm running on a slate of three women. 
um, two for assembly, one for state senate. So the term feminism is something that we are very proud of and we engage in on a daily basis. But to carve out this special space for Asian American feminism was something that was, frankly, was very new to me. You know, uh, growing up, to be honest, I had a very conservative father who gave me three choices for the future of my life, which was you can be a doctor, a lawyer, or you can marry one of those. <laughs> and I think it was, you know, choice number three that really speaks to this sort of niche topic of Asian American feminism. When I ran for council and I really reached out to the Asian American, especially the Korean American community to try to garner support, especially financial support, a lot of the older generation men said, well, that's really cute. <laughs> you know, that's, that's really cute that you're trying to do something like that, but what do you really doing for work or you know what what are you really doing for um, money so and now that I'm coming out for assembly uh, early on I had somebody say and somebody who had good intentions you know tell me that that was not something that a woman should be doing as the first so he wanted as the first Korean American to be a man because he thought the chances were much higher that if we were going to push somebody, we should push a man because then we have a chance to win. Um, which I'll have to prove him wrong in November. <laughs> so this whole concept of Asian American feminism, I think I am starting to get it a little bit. Um, it's, it's something that I think that Asian Americans, we deal with, that maybe no other feminist really understands. Uh, the expectation for us to be good homemakers, you know. I have a six-year-old, and there's a lot of pressure as a mom, but when you get into the Asian American community of mothers, it seems like the pressure is like that much more elevated, you know. I mean, they, they share stories of, oh, what did you pack for lunch today? And I'm, I'm just like, I don't know. I, <laughs> I threw something together. I'm, I'm looking at Remus like, what did you have for lunch today? You know, and then you have the other Korean moms who have like bento boxes at the wazoo, right? Uh, but that all speaks to this this element of Asian American feminism. This is something that Asian American women are not familiar with, politics. It's not something that we've ever even, even entertained or even dreamed about. You know, I didn't know how to say politics in Korean until I ran in 2015. It was just a word that wasn't spoken um, in our household, and especially to me. So I think that um, I love this cross path of Asian American feminism and politics. And I'm hoping that this year, with the whole movement of women organizing, by the way, it's been amazing everywhere. I'm telling you, in New Jersey, it's the women that are driving all the progressive movements, all of the change, all of the rallies, anything good that's come out of the election of last year has been primarily um, been driven by women. So it just tells you when we're pissed off, <laughs> We're gonna let you know, and that is when it comes to Asian American women, and you get the dragon moms out there, and you piss them off, it's gonna mean something. So I'm still figuring this thing out, this Asian American feminism, but I'm starting to understand it a little bit more. And I hope that we will continue to engage this conversation online so I can learn a little bit um, more from you guys, too. I just don't like labels, so I don't use a lot of this identity labeling things because every single time when somebody wants to talk about a woman, especially a woman of color, who wants to run for office, you know, you're too this, or you're too that, or you're not this enough, and you're not that enough. And to me, I just feel like, you know, I'm just gonna go away with labels. Like my best friend, she actually passed away just recently, but, you know, she, she goes by gender smooshy. <laughs> you know, she's smooshy, <laughs> so she likes to say that. And, uh, for me, I just think that there's nothing that encompasses um, my identity more than just saying that I'm my mother's daughter. Um, I'm somebody who uh, feels very strongly about um, a pipeline, uh, you know, always making sure that our community will continue to have the opportunities to 
have the ability to fight for each other and to help each other out and to be able to make sure that we're providing resources for each other in order to lift each other up. Because I think it's important um, more than anything to not be, um, I think our community is very cannibalistic <laughs> in a lot of ways, right? I think that there's a lot of ways to be able to be supportive of one another. Uh, and I think that because we have a false notion of where uh, resources or something are limited, because um, you know some people people might have a notion that you know well, we, we have to have an Asian win and maybe a guy right so it would be better. Um, we think that we think that resources are limited. We think that positions are limited. We think that you know money raised is limited. We think that you know. Uh, resources of, of uh, folks are limited. And so um, I think that that's erroneous. I think that uh, we have to grow, and the more that we grow, the more that we grow in power, and that we are able to help each other out even further. Um, I like to think of it as a ladder, right? You know, we help one person up, and then the, the, that person helps the other person up, and we can keep on climbing. And I think that, uh, you know, for me, that's how my mom was for me. Right. She was always creating opportunities for me, helping me to be able to continue to open more doors for myself. Um, and you know, I think it's so important that we have mentorship. So I identify as um, a mentee and a mentor. Um, I have a lot of uh, young people who are very, very driven in my uh, office. And you know, I had 300 plus young volunteers in my campaign. And um, in my office now, and we literally don't have the office space, I had to go talk to the speaker today to ask for more. <laughs> because there are so many people who want to actually um, work with somebody who looks like them. And I think that we have to make sure that we're providing those opportunities. I myself started off as an intern, and I think that it's so important that we're able to open the doors for more and more people. And for me, I think that those are the things that I want to identify as somebody who helps create opportunities and somebody uh, who makes sure that we have a strong pipeline. So. Tell us about that moment that you decided this is gonna this is the thing that I'm going to do. I'm going to say yes. I'm going to run for office. So, well, this is kind of personal, so I'm just gonna <laughs> put it out there. But I never thought that I would run for office, and I think that that's something that a lot of women tell themselves. And I think that that's something that we constantly um, we have this internalized oppression that we can't get rid of, I think. There's a voice that self-doubts, and um, unfortunately for so many folks, I think the reality is that people don't realize that um, before anything, women self-select out of a lot of races, of a lot of different opportunities. And um, there's a statistic that my, uh, one of my colleagues cited, and she said that, you know, Monica Wallace, and she just said to me that, um, you know, actually, it is true that women have just as much chance as men to be able to win in an election. It's just that we self-select out. I had a hard time actually coming to terms with the fact that I might run. Um, I talked to Assembly Member Kim um, when he kept on suggesting it. At first, I was hoping he was joking. And <laughs> when it turned out that he wasn't, um, so for those of you who don't know, my, my seat was occupied by the former speaker of the assembly, Sheldon Silver. And um, you know, a lot of people had already looked at that seat when he was first indicted, and then you know, there was a lot of people already coming out and speaking about what they wanted to do. I was first approached by my current senator, uh, Senator Daniel Squadron, when he um, found out that I lived in the district, <laughs> and he was just like, whoa, you know, do you think you would want to run? And I was just like, I don't think so. And then Ron was just like, wouldn't it be funny? And so, like, <laughs> <laughs> so we were talking about it for a really long time. Um, and by the way, I approached my chief of staff from Squadron's office, so just, <laughs> I got my revenge. Um, so, so I, um, you know, I, I really had to kind of think about what I wanted to do, if I really wanted to, uh, take the risk and you know not get paid for a whole year by the way like when you're running you're not employed and uh, and you know make sure that I um, was able to do it 
And you have to remember the pay in the assembly isn't very good. And so, you know, there was no way you're gonna make it up. It's just like, you know, it's like hand to mouth all the time. Um, but it's a it's a huge risk. And I knew that if I was to run for office, I would be um, and, and and win, I would be the first Asian American in any other borough but Queens to win. So like I knew that it was going to be very challenging, but it was also going to make history. Um, but I, I didn't think to myself that, you know, that was the purpose. I just thought, well, that's really sad. Um, and maybe it's impossible. Uh, and that's something that I think, you know, is an internal dialogue that probably shouldn't have happened. Uh, I think that one of the things that really uh, helped when I was going through that was calling a lot of my mentors and going through and talking to them and really having the dialogue. And you know, most of them asked the same question that Ron did to me. And he just said, do you think anybody else would do this better than you? And I had to look around and I looked at all of my opponents, I looked at all the folks that had thought about running it, and I just realized I am the only person with any state level experience. And not only do I have state, have state level experience, I have 15 years of state level experience. I was, you know, more qualified than probably at the assembly. I mean, it was, <laughs> It, it was a reason though, it was, it was more like, why am I asking myself whether or not I would be qualified? And I think so many people, so many women especially, and so many women of color especially, ask that question and, and, and have that hesitation. They say, hey, you know, am I, am I ready for this? Maybe a couple more years will give me more experience. Maybe, you know, somebody else will do this better than me. Maybe all of these things. And so it, it's a cycle that keeps on going in your head. And to me, you know, I had to, kind of overcome all of that, I had to really um, step up my own realization that it's internalized depression that I was constantly telling myself. And you know, anything outside, all of that noise that was coming at me, it, it wasn't hurting me as much as I was. So that was what helped me back. decided for yourself that this was the path that you were going to take, that you were going to run to run for office. Yes. Uh, I actually think that it was a story that I had heard, and I think this was the actual moment I had decided to run. I heard a story about a family, a Korean-speaking family, who had a medical emergency, so they called 911. First responders appeared at their door and there was a huge language barrier. They needed to know if the patient was taking any medication, if they had allergies, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, everybody was staring at each other because they couldn't speak the language. So then they scrambled and started calling the local church pastors, um, Korean church pastors. And this was like at two, three in the morning. Um, thankfully, the injured, um, wasn't seriously injured and recovered, but it was a moment for me of realizing how much representation is needed. Prior to that, I'm not sure that I really understood what a gap of representation meant or the lack of representation. Uh, you know, I just lived my daily life. I didn't have a lot of issues within the community I lived in. I assimilated well, so I thought, and I thought I had all my needs taken care of. When I started to hear stories like that, that's when I realized, well, this can't go on for any longer. We were, we're not living in archaic times. Like, we need to have that representation there. So I think that was the moment that I really realized. Um, what I didn't realize was the level of commitment it would take to win a race. And what the assemblywoman said was exactly right, because the first thoughts that came into my mind was, well, surely there must be somebody far more qualified, because I'm not qualified to do this. I don't know, I don't know our municipal budget. You know, I don't know our you know, local tax codes. I don't know our borough building codes. Then I realized nobody who is elected <laughs> knows. <laughs> so, but uh, I think as women, 
Um, that's what we do. We go through that whole list, and it's an impossible list to beat, and then we beat ourselves out of it. <coughs> So, uh, you know, my family really played an integral role in putting the pressure on and supporting me, and I think that I probably couldn't have done it if I didn't have that support around me. My um, six-year-old, who was four at the time, just thought I went on vacation for the whole summer. <laughs> so every time he saw me, you know, because we were always campaigning at night and, and during the day, so every time he saw me, he just said, where did you go this time? <laughs> and I said, nowhere. I was down the street knocking on doors. <laughs> and the, the funny thing is, so this year when I, I'm running for assembly and I had a, him make a little video for me and I'm interviewing him and I say, Remus, how do you think I can win this with this uphill battle election this year? And he goes, well, if you go on vacation, you'll win because that's his connection. I was on vacation and then I won. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a serious level of commitment, which I didn't realize, but I, I think it's good I didn't realize, because maybe I would have thrown that in, too, as like another reason of why I shouldn't do it. But that was pretty much the reason. In this moment, it feels like every day we're up against so much. Um, how are you finding opportunities to build with other communities, um, and particularly other, other communities of color, whether it's at your organization, Marion, um, or in your roles? Um, yeah, um, so the New American Leaders Project um, is an unapologetically pan-ethnic. So when we talk about immigrant and children of immigrants, we don't focus on one particular community, but make sure that throughout all of our trainings, a diversity of immigrant communities are represented at the table. Um, but before I go into that um, and like our, our strategy towards partnership building, I just do, I want to thank both of you, Councilwoman and Assemblywoman, for sharing so vulnerably your experiences. Like I cannot tell you how reminiscent those origin stories are to a lot of our women who ended up just taking the chance to run for office and then a couple years down the road became one of the most fierce um, vocal um, leaders of the resistance. Um, it just remind me of one of the, um, the women that we trained in Arizona. Arizona, um, where SB 1070 was originated, the Show Me Your Papers law, one of the most anti-immigrant uh, state legislators in the country, um, and where a lot of the anti-immigrant um, legislation first pops up, um, she never thought of herself. She actually just took the training just to see how well she, she would do and just like ramp up her leadership and see what sort of skills that she can, um, can cultivate. Um, but when she said her son's speech, shared her story, um, she was super involved in her kids' school. Um, we asked if she um, would want to run for office. She's actually a formerly undocumented American, right? So that already carries a lot of baggage. Um, and she was she was recently, um, you know, naturalized uh, after IRCA was passed. Um, and so she never thought of herself as a political figure until we asked her if she would maybe consider school board. Um, it's about, like one of the most local levels of government and um, a great way to have a say in educational policy. And she was like, all right, I'll think about it. And she took another training later that year, um, met another alum, uh, they got together, started scheming, and both of them ended up defeating the incumbent and becoming state representatives in Arizona. And they are fierce, like you don't even know, they are shutting it down on the floor. Um, and we love it. Um, so I just want to thank you um, and, and let you know that these sort of stories, um, being the first, being the only, um, they're rare. Oh, Fifteen seconds wrap up. <laughs> They're rare, but they don't have to. They don't have to be it. Um, and women of color experience this a lot. We have to ask women at least seven times to run for office before they even consider it. So I'm asking you all now to seriously consider it. Um, we are all here for a reason, and we have our own skills and qualifications that would add a lot of value to the way that we pass policies in state legislature, city council, community board. Right. Um, so. To answer your question about community building, um, we try to make sure to lower the barriers for people to take our trainings, um, for those who express financial need, um, being really intersectional about that, so folks who are a little bit lower income but still have incredible track records of leadership in the community should be just as qualified um, and able to take our trainings as other people who may have come from the Obama administration or something. Um, so that's how we built um, coalitions. And we talk about how to talk about your story through universal values. And so it doesn't have to just 
relate to the Asian American community. The values that we have that and um, have cultivated growing up through our, our family stories, how they came from the motherland to the United States, um, the values of hard work, um, focusing on our community, and um, just doing the good work, um, that is a universal value that can um, relate to, to a lot of our communities. Awesome. The uh, question was about community building. Yeah, community building, and in particular, how are you uh, building with other communities of color? I think just being a minority woman of color running for a seat where there is zero, <laughs> it uh, kind of brings a certain kind of attention to you. <laughs> uh, you know, I, anything that I see that has minority Asian anything, I just naturally gravitate towards. And that's how I came here. I saw this pop up on my Facebook feed. Um, I had really no idea of this organization before. And I came to attend, and then Congresswoman Mike couldn't make it, so I was asked to um, join the panel. Um, I, I think that it's, you know, it's a movement. It's, it's an organic movement, you know. I guess, people of color, women of color coming together. But I'll tell you, 2015 when I ran, and this year when I'm running, it's a completely different vibe and it's a completely different type of energy that's out there. I mean, there really is a fever and there really is sort of a desperation to come together. And so I love it and it's been a lot easier for us to organize. It's been a lot easier for me to reach out to those organizations that support women of color. And it's, it's growing at a speed that is just unbelievable. So um, kudos to everybody in this room, because you guys are all part of that movement. Awesome. Building bridges can always be done through the gift of song. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not kidding. It's always through karaoke. <laughs> Actually, so my Uncle Bob Santos, uh, he's actually an incredible legend, probably in all of the API history, blah, 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 community, etc., etc. But he uh, taught me a lot of uh, how coalition building works. So in Seattle, Washington, um, you know, people know a little bit about the Gang of Four. I don't know if people have heard about them, but they, they call them the Four Amigos or the Gang of Four. Um, and it's Uncle Bob Santos who's actually married to Sharon Tomiko Santos, who founded NAPA. And um, Bernie White Bear, Larry Gossett, and Roberto Maestes. Larry Gossett was um, the executive director of the Urban League, and Bernie White Bear was uh, the executive director of Daybreak Star, and Uncle Bob was director of um, Interim, et cetera. And, um, you know, of course, Roberto Maestes was El Centro de la Raza. And so, you know, they were legendary, and they worked together. And instead of you know, splitting up and fighting for the same piece of pie, they decided they were just going to get together and ask for more pie. And <laughs> as the councilwoman said, you know, when you're the only, it makes it so that you really do need a lot of friends. <laughs> when you're gonna do anything. So, um, you know, up in assembly, we, we have an amazing caucus that we work with. So we have a caucus of folks who, um, are from all the different minority communities that uh, get together and we're 55 strong, so we move legislation together a lot. When we are together, we are able to do a lot of things that are almost impossible. Um, this year, we got raised the age, and that means that you know, for the first time, New York State will um, join the rest of the country <laughs> and make sure that minorities are treated uh, uh, minors are treated the same um, in the court system. Uh, so, you know, my, minors uh, are actually treated as minors. And so I think that that's going to be the first time. And so this is an incredibly important piece of legislation, uh, legislation especially for uh, communities of color. And we were not able to meet that legislation unless we stood together and stood strong. So that's why, you know, if we can stick together and ask for more pie, we can get it. And all of that is doing it to song. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you also to Assemblymember Nao.